It's a compare and contrast series. So we're going to start with every week. You can look forward to this. Every week, we're going to start with the bad side. And then we're going to end with the good side. So the, the bad side is the immoral person. The immoral person. That's a heading in your, in your notes. And we're going to talk about what the immoral person is. Of course, in Proverbs, it talks about the immoral woman, mostly. But I'm, I, you know, from reading it and studying it, it's really the immoral. It's the thing. It's the object of a person's lust. It's the object of a person's desire. So it's not just this person that we're trying to stay away from. It's the object of immorality that we're trying to stay away from, okay? So let's start right there just by saying that. So when I'm talking about the immoral person, I'm talking about us. I'm talking about you and me. I'm talking about our tendencies. I'm talking about you and me when we allow ourselves to slip into immorality, five weeks without preaching, and I cannot believe I'm doing this. But it is, it's going to be a lot of fun. I, I, I honestly think you're going to be blessed. So, so I encourage you, lean in, lean in and, and listen to this. There are three characteristics of the immoral person that I want to talk to you about. Number one is this. The immoral person is, number one, oblivious to the danger of immorality. Oblivious to the danger. We're going to be largely in Proverbs 5 and 7, two chapters that are almost exclusively dedicated to this immorality topic, Proverbs 5 and 7. I encourage you to go home and you can just read them yourself. But the immoral person is oblivious to the danger of immorality. When we don't give immorality the credit it deserves, then we're in danger. Then we're in danger because lust is a capable opponent for everyone. I've had people tell me, oh, I don't struggle with that. Okay, Okay, the reports are in, all right? Google the rates, you know, like the reports are in. This is something that 99.9% of people struggle with in, in some way or another. If you're oblivious to that, then you're in danger. Or if you refuse to admit, that's something I've seen. As a pastor, people refuse to admit, oh no, never. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So you get a pass on this. But let's, let's see what Solomon wrote to his sons in Proverbs 7. Proverbs 7, starting in verse 7, I saw some naive young men and one in particular who lacked common sense. He was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman, strolling down the, this is what I see. He's just, he's just strolling, just like this. Just, there's an immoral woman right here. He's just strolling. I don't know why, but like big walk, a big, big stroll walk down by the path by her house. It was twilight in the evening as deep darkness fell. Watch this. The woman approached him. This is going to be important for us to understand. The woman approached him, seductively dressed and sly of heart. Notice this. I'm going to teach you the Bible right now. I'm going to teach you something about what Solomon's teaching us, about what the Bible is teaching us. Number one thing is right here. He didn't go after it. He was oblivious to it. And she came after him. She did, he, did, he wasn't looking for trouble. She came after him. That is so, so important to understand. When I realized this for the first time, it really made me sit up straight in my chair. Just as a, as a regular human, I'm like, oh my God, this is coming for us. It's coming for you. It's coming for your kids. It's coming for us. Don't be oblivious. Impure things will come and find you. My first introduction, I'm gonna get real with you guys. Is that all right to, to do in church, to be honest with you? It's very embarrassing, but... It is what it is. I was a young kid, and the first time I was introduced to pornographic material, I was on my way. I was with my mom. I was less than 10 years old. Can't remember how old I was. I was probably like eight, something like that. And we were on our way to the YMCA. We were on our way. I remember. We were going there, and it was like we, were, we swam there, or did something. And she's up there like moms do. She's like, hurry up. And she's going you know, to the door. Come on, moms. You know who you are. I hurt. Oh. And I'm like lagging behind, lagging behind, and my head's down, and there's a, a cutout from a magazine on the ground right there. And I'm just walking right by it. And eight-year-old boy is like, what's this? It changed, like chemicals started firing off in my brain. My, my destiny changed at that moment because it set something off in me. It awakened love in me that should not have been, you know, the, the scripture says, don't awaken love too early. It was on the ground. It was on the ground for some little boy to find. So that, let me just tell you, this stuff is out there. And this was before the internet, y'all. This is before reels, okay? This is, just, this is just me walking. So 
Nowadays, you, your, your kids or you could be singing hymns to yourself. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. You're like, you're worshiping God on this number right here, just <laughs> laughing at reels. And then all of a sudden, bam, there it is. If you are oblivious to the fact that this stuff is coming for you, I mean, Facebook and Instagram does not care about your soul. They'll put stuff out there just to see if you bite. You don't have to express any interest in it at all, but they'll just put stuff out there because, I mean, why wouldn't they? That keeps you on there more. And I'm just trying to tell you, this is, don't be oblivious. Don't be oblivious. I have tips and tricks to help you with this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna incorporate them in this message, but we gotta move on. But do yourself a favor. Don't be like the guy that Proverbs talks about. Before he was immoral, he was oblivious. Don't be oblivious and don't be like, nah, that ain't a thing. It's a huge thing. It's a huge thing right now. In our culture today, this is a huge, huge deal. Don't be oblivious to the amount of immorality in the world. Number two, the immoral person knows the danger, but doesn't avoid it, but doesn't avoid it. Maybe you know about the danger, but you're like, bah. Nah, I mean, it's just like, you know, I mean, I know, sure, it's there, it's around, but what am I gonna do? You know what I mean? Like change my life or, you know, change my habits or like actually avoid it. Pfft, that seems like a lot of work. An immoral person will, may even know about the danger, but doesn't avoid it. Remember Proverbs 7 and 8, it says he was crossing the street near the house of an immoral woman. So let's, let's put it another way. Let's, he knows this is an adulteress that lives in this house. But I mean, I mean, come on, this is my way to work. I'm not gonna like go 30 seconds to go around. I mean, it's like, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? You know how this story ends? Oh, I'm, I'm gonna get there. He didn't think, this man didn't think he needed to change any of his habits or any of his behavior. Proverbs 5, let's jump to Proverbs 5, 22. An evil man is held captive by his own desires. There are ropes that catch and hold him. He will die for lack of self-control. He will be lost because of his great foolishness. Let me just tell you something. Proactive self-control is better than in the moment self-control. Like you're gonna need self, like if she throws herself at you, you're gonna need self-control. But let me put it to you this way. This is really important. This is a phrase. I highlighted it. I wrote it so that you would hear it just this way. Listen to this. The more you subject yourself to temptation, the more likely you will be to succumb to it. All right. Okay? So you're going to need self-control. There's no way to get around the need for self-control here and there. But proactive self-control, that's real wisdom. Proverbs said he was walking around where temptation is. That's a fool. Because of his great foolishness, he was lost. Parents, let me talk to parents for a second. You need to help your kids know about and practice safeguarding their purity. They need, your kids need to know that this crap is out there. And they need to know how to prevent and stay away from it. They need to know. We live in a technological world. They need to understand how to keep themselves safe. And parents, it's up to us to help them. Parents, it's up to us to help ourselves. Some of us don't even understand how to stay safe from it. And so I'm going to get there. I'm, I'm getting there. So, so stay tuned, tune in. But like, just to, just to like make this real, I got a call from a parent. Uh, this was sometime last year, a call from a parent here at this church, uh, reached out to me, horrified, horrified because their young son, went too, too young to understand what was going on but was, was on the TV, had a TV in their room with, it was a smart TV and Amazon Prime had something on there sure. that was, I can't even tell you the name of it, okay? It was, it was dirty. It was not appropriate for adult Christian people to be watching that. And she walks in, the eight-year-old is going, what? what's, <laughs> like hiding the remote. Like he doesn't even know what he's hiding from basically, but he knows it's wrong. Right, I'm just letting you know, and she was horrified, and I like began to like, hey, you know, smart TVs, you know, you gotta, you gotta be sharp, mom, dad, you gotta be, sh you gotta understand that when you turn on Vizio, like the home screen has stuff I don't want to see on it. No you know what I'm talking about? Is anybody like with me on that? Like, I open up my own Vizio home screen, I got a picture of like two ladies like about to embrace. I'm like, what the? I like, I gotta get like quick off of here. It's like I can't even get rid of it. Just having, like, I'm just letting you know, we live in a technological world 
So you need to understand like what level are you willing, like you need to go to like a different kind of TV or set something up or have some safeguards, whatever. We live in a technological world. So I'm, I'm asking you parents to be sharp. I'm asking you parents to be sharp. Now I'm gonna get real, this is about as hard as it gets right here. This is pretty tough, but then it's gonna start to lighten up. All right, so hang in there, hold on to your chair. Number three is this, believes the lie. An immoral person believes the lie. I'm not hurting anybody. This is no big deal. I'm not hurting any. I'm like, come on, just like let me live my life, okay? Let me, let me, let me do what I want, love who I love, and whatever. It's like, it's like, let, I'm not hurting it. I'm just, it's just me and my phone. Like, come on, give me a break. This is 2024. You're not talking like that. Nobody's talking to me like that, but it's deep inside. <laughs> I, I threw a lot of sarcasm on you just now. I'm like, you're not that. I'm sorry if that's you, but like, it's, it's really, it's actually more deep in your heart. That's like, this is not, okay, all right. Your obligatory message about sexual purity, whatever. No, 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 no. This, the, the, the immoral person can fall into the trap and believe the lie. This is not hurting anybody. Leave me alone. I can understand if it was this, but this little thing, no, it's not a big deal. This is the attitude people have when they're already involved, usually, and just don't want to stop. I'll be honest, this is the hardest person to help. It's the hardest person to help because how are you going to help someone that, you know, doesn't care, um, that doesn't really want to change? People who are caught up looking at things, it's, I'm not hurting anybody, I'm just looking, whatever. Uh, people who are having emotional affairs, you know, and this is something that, if I'll just be like my own opinion, like ladies, this tends to be like the hardest one, like emotional stuff, like I'm having like an emotional attachment that I shouldn't have. Ah, it's not hurting anybody, it's funny, whatever. It's no big deal. We're just friends. Or maybe even a, a full-blown premarital stuff, like, like just live, sleeping with and everything before marriage. The Bible is pretty clear about how we shouldn't be doing that. It's, I'm not hurting anybody. We're just, we're just, we gotta try each other out. I'm sorry, was that too much? But that's what people say. This is what people say to me. Like, how, you, gotta, you gotta see if you fit with each other. It's like, no. No, we're believing the lie. I'm not hurting anybody. But let me tell you, Ask your future spouse. I'm just, okay. This is, hard. this is hard for me as it is for you because I care about, I want, I want you to understand. I want your friends and family to understand this. And I know some of us just have people in our lives. Maybe you're dealing with this. But once you're in it, it's like quicksand. You get stuck in it. And it's really hard to help someone like this. Proverbs 7, 23. He was like a bird flying into a snare, little knowing it would cost him his life. Sometimes the, 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 the penalty is not obvious to some of these activities we're doing. I mean, traps are set to look good. This is fun. You know, let's just, let's whatever. It's no big deal. So how do we warn people? Uh, you don't typically win people over by fighting with them about their lifestyle. I mean, you gotta say something, but I mean, fighting hardly ever does it. That's why I said this is a really hard one. How do you win someone over that has a completely different worldview or belief system and is living a lifestyle that's, like, I'll tell you when I find out. Okay, I don't know, like prayer, Honestly, prayer, I do actually have one story. I'll try to keep it short, but I have one story of a, of a very miraculous situation where I was able to minister to someone and break them out of a lifestyle where they were like, come on, it's just whatever. This is a long time ago. Before I was a pastor, I came to this church and we used to take mission trips to San Francisco. Okay, you know where I'm going. But it was like the homeless, like the tenderloin, the homelessness and whatever. But we also went once with another ministry. We went to the, the pride parade there and we didn't go to pick it. We didn't go to protest, but we also didn't go to support, just to be clear. We just went. But the ministry we went and partnered with was like, we went, we did this, something I've never heard of before. I've never heard of since. It was like this undercover thing where we did destiny readings. Super like mystical. And there's people lined up for blocks at, the, at our tent, destiny readings. Some of us remember this going there. And I was like, just so wet behind the ears. I didn't know what was going on, but they're like, hey, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna tell people they're getting destiny readings and this is when they come in, all you're gonna do is ask them, hey, is it okay if I pray to the creator of the universe, the king of the universe, specific language, they would understand that and we know who that is, but it's also kind of like generic. And we just ask permission. Can I have your permission to, to, to ask the, the God of the universe to speak on your behalf and to, to give me a word for you? And they would all say yes. And then we would just begin to pray over them and prophesy over them. Like, that's all we did. And I did that. I, was, I didn't know what I was doing. I was like 21, 23 years old. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm at this crazy place. There's all kinds of stuff going on. It's like wild. 
over there. Everybody's drinking, smoking. It's like, it's a crazy scene. Um, and I'm in there and this is what happens. This girl comes in. I don't remember what her name was. It's so long ago. Even if I knew her name, I wouldn't tell you. Or let's just say her name was Katie. Katie, sorry. <laughs> when I was rehearsing, I was like, I'm going to say Katie, but it's not, it's not you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, she had a... Uh, she was, uh, she was probably no more than 21 years old, uh, pretty black girl, had a nose ring. Or she just was like in the moment and she was just like living her best life, okay? And her friends are there. She's happy. Everything's fine. She comes in. Yeah, Destiny reading. Let's go. She sits down in front of me and I'm like, hey, do I have your permission to pray for you and, and just ask the creator of the universe to speak a word on your behalf? And she's like, sure, sure. And I, so I prayed, God, would you, would you please give me a word for Katie? And as I prayed, I was like, oh, oh. And God actually, he spoke to me. And I knew right then that she had already been getting like in her dreams. She had already been, God has already been like ministering to her, talking to her. And I knew in that moment that I could basically say anything I want to. And, 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 and she was going to listen. Cause I'm like, Hey, Katie, God's already speaking to you. Hasn't he? She, her face just goes, whoop. Yes. I'm like, he's been speaking to you in, in your dreams. Hasn't he? She stops. Her friends are like eye hustling. They're getting the old, their stuff, but they're like, they're looking and she's like frozen. She's not looking to the left or to the right. She doesn't want to see them. She's looking at me. She's like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And I said, hey, what if I told you that right here, right now, God would totally transform your life, totally restore your life. All you have to do is come to him. All you have to do is ask and he would do it right here, right now. And she's like, her eyes are watering and she's like, doesn't want to be hurt. But she's like, yes, I do want that. And so we just did the prayer. I'm like, hey, would you just repeat after me all my sins and transform my life, fill me with your spirit? She's shaking in her boots and she's she's starting to cry right there. And so she stands up with her friends, she leaves. I have no idea what happened to her. I have no idea what happened to Katie. My whole point in telling you that is sometimes in people's lives and and with with people, the the point is sometimes it takes a miraculous encounter to break someone out when they when they're believing something that's not true when they're believing a lifestyle is, is not harmful or if they're stuck in something, uh, some kind of immorality and, and, you know, not just guys looking at stuff and being like, ah, it's fine, but like a whole host of things, it can feel so, like so much bondage, you know, like you're so trapped, you know? And sometimes it takes a miracle and it takes God intervening to step in and jar us out and say, oh my God, he sees me. And so, she was hurting in her soul so deep and I was so excited, but let's, let's make it better now. Let's, let's talk about the good. Like, how do we get on, stay on the path of the pure? Let's talk about the way of the pure. This issue we're talking about today is absolutely no joke. The rest of this whole series is going to be fun loving. Don't be lazy. Don't be a fool. But this is like, don't die. I know, but it's, I'm serious. This is so important. It's such a critical thing. Sexual immorality destroys your calling, destroys your purpose, destroys relationships, and can destroy your entire life. In fact, the reason I'm preaching about this today is because there's a because there's been a lot of pastors falling lately. I don't know if you watch the news much or whatever, but um, it's been happening. It's, it's historical. It's always happened. But let me just start off by saying this. For every one pastor that's failed, there's a thousand that have held strong Amen. and maintained their purity. And so just because some hit the headlines, that doesn't mean whatever, but it does make me sit up straight in my chair a little bit. And there was one guy from Kentucky and I'm like, I don't know who that is. That seems really bad. I'm, I'm sorry that happened. And then there was another guy that it happened. I've heard of him really famous. This was like six months ago, 12 months ago. And I'm like, huh, that's weird. Step down and whatever. And then somebody I have been listening to and, and has been ministering to me my entire Christianity. It hits CNN, He's a huge pastor. His name's Robert Morris. And, and we've, we've brought his books here. I've done classes with him and it devastated me, devastated me. I was on vacation. I was camping when I got the news and I was like, what? Are you, what do you mean? How could this happen? And it wasn't like he was doing something. It was like 35 years ago, but he covered it up. So it was dirty. It was dirty. It's the whole thing is a whole big mess. And so I was like, no, I'm not waiting another second. We're talking about this because this will destroy us. It destroys entire churches. It destroys your calling. It will destroy. I'm telling you what, that man, and we're not doing any more of his stuff. I can't, I'm not going to, but I can't undo what I do. I'm so sorry. I, nobody knew. I didn't know. 
That man's life is over. His calling is over. His legacy is dead. His kids can't even pastor anymore. Anywhere. It's too high profile. His kids won't even be allowed to pastor that church that their dad built. And he has kids that were on track to do that. None of them can do anything in ministry anymore. Not without, I mean, even him, no. The kids, maybe, maybe, but not there. I'm, I'm telling you, this is so destructive and dangerous. We have to talk about this. How do we stay safe? We need to do number one, the way of the pure. Number one is this. We need to understand the traps set by the enemy. We need to understand the traps set by the enemy. Because if we just walk around and say, oh, it's not gonna happen to me. That's what I thought until I saw this guy who I had believed in. I was like, oh my God, it could happen to anybody. Happen to anybody, happen to me, happen to us. I'm like, so care. I'm like looking around going, what's in my life? Like I need to clean up myself, but that's a good thing. You know, it, it wakes us up, church. Sure. It wakes us up. We need to understand the traps set by the enemy. This whole issue would not be an issue if it wasn't so deceptive. We're deceived because something looks good and looks safe, but it's deadly. Proverbs 5.1, my son, pay attention to my wisdom. Listen carefully to my wise counsel. Then you will show discernment. Your lips will express what you've learned. For the lips of an immoral woman are sweet as honey. Her mouth is smoother than oil, but in the end, she's bitter as poison, as dangerous as a double-edged sword. Have you ever seen a mouse trap? I came home from camp and to see a, a, a mouse snapped in half. And you know what? A, a mouse looks at that. It's like, oh, some cheese, some peanut butter. looks good. But a mouse can't comprehend that this thing is set up to destroy me. And you're thinking, well, I would see if it could, it's going to snap on me. No, that's exactly what lust is like. We look at it and, and it seems harmless. The thing that's, that's tempting you, the, the person that just wants to DM you, or the thing that just seems kind of harmless, it's kind of funny, but also sexual. It's like, it seems harmless. That's what makes it so dangerous. That's what makes it so deadly. We have to understand this is a trap and it's designed to kill you and your family, destroy your family, destroy your calling, destroy your purpose, destroy your legacy. Amen. It can and will. Are you hearing me today, church? I hope you're hearing me, I hope you're getting this and at least waking up to the severity of what even the small stuff is leading to. Nowadays, there's pathways everywhere to full-blown stuff, That's right. everywhere to full-blown stuff. Oh my gosh, a pure person knows and understands that even small acts of immorality will grow and lead to death. So that's, that's what I really want everyone in the church to understand is that the way of the pure understands that even small things will inevitably grow. That's the nature of this trap and the sickness and disease is like the little stuff will grow into more. Okay, here's the big one. This is the most practical, super duper practical one. Number two, uh, uh, the way of the pure is to avoid the place of temptation. Right. Avoids the place of temptation. Notice the language. Don't just avoid the act of sinning. I want you to avoid the temptation. So like the act is here. The temptation is here next to the sin. I don't want you to live here. I want you to live way over here. Right. That's, what, that's what Proverbs is teaching us that we miss. We miss that. Watch in the scriptures right here, Proverbs uh, 5, 7, and 8. So now, my sons, listen to me. Never stray from what I'm about to say. Stay away from her. Don't go near the door of her house. He didn't say not go in. He said don't even go near her door. Yeah. I don't even want you walking by there because that's too close. I want you walking on the total other side. I want you staying as far as you can away from the act itself. So not just the act not just the temptation, I want you outside the place of temptation. Outside the place of temptation. That's the safe zone. That's where I want us. That's where I want me. That's where I want to live. So Proverbs 7.25 says it another way. Don't let your hearts stray away toward her. Not even close to her. Don't wander down. I don't even want you going down her street. <laughs> I don't want you on that street. Oh, but that's the way to my work. Go a different way. It's not a big deal. Go a different way. Way, married people, listen to me right now. Know and safeguard thoughts and actions that lead to immorality. Not just immorality itself. I want you to know and safeguard actions and, and places that you're tempted to be immoral. Where is that? Where is that? If you're one decision away from the act itself, you're already way too close. 
You hear what I'm saying? Way too close. So if social media for you leads to bouncing over to the other thing, then social media is not for you or you need to learn to safeguard your stuff because we live in a technology world. I'm gonna talk to you about that right now. Um, I utilize things like, and I've done this for years and I'm shoring it all up, like accountability software, um, site blockers. I've had that stuff installed standard. It's on every single device here at the church. Why? Because I don't want... My, not only me, but anybody here to be one click away. I want, I want to be so far, it's not even possible. I want to set up, all, we live in a technological world, so we need to learn how to use technology to our advantage and become like first name basis for all Christians to know words like um, Covenant Eyes. It's a software company that does this. Uh, Accountable to You is software that does this. The Freedom is like a site blocker so that so for me, I know that I don't want to spend any more than like 10 minutes at a time on social media. So I have it set up on my phone and, and Tiffany can, and she's the one that set it all up. So I can't even mess with it. And after like 20 minutes, like the people that help me with social media around here, they're like, can you do this? Yeah. At this certain time. Cause that's when my window is. Why? Because I'm not stupid. All right. I'm sorry. You're not stupid either. <laughs> I don't mean that. I just mean, I know. Like, I'm a young man, and I, I grew up with, with, with internet, and I know, like, that stuff's all around. So I'm going to be smarter than my enemy, or at least try to be, and set myself up so it's not even possible. It's not even like you can't even look at stuff if you wanted to on my stuff because I set it up that way. I encourage that for every single person here, especially men. This tends to be, this tends to be something men need the most. Not that women wouldn't need it, but like I said, Women, I want you to be extra attentive of your emotional engagement with people. Emotional engagement with, with people that are trying to, you know, bring you in. Oh, just that nice, that friendly. Like, the block button is really good. Like, it works. Block works. Like, if you got somebody, you know, they're not following the Lord. They don't want anything good for you, but they make you laugh a little bit. And they're, like, trying to, like, get into those, those not even one DM. Block works. They won't see you. You won't see them. They're gone. Get them out of here. You don't need them. I don't, want, I don't want to be anywhere near that crap. Do you? You're like, I'm frozen. I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with you, pastor. I got you. <laughs> Emotional affairs can destroy marriage just like immorality would. So ladies, I'm just, I, I don't want to leave you out because this tends to be a topic that only gets directed at men, but it's not just for men. It's for ladies too. But that's, that's the area where it tends to happen. Um, just... Be, be on your guard. Don't be oblivious, all right? Be aware that this is a trap set for you. Um, Solomon didn't say, don't go in her house. He said, don't even go near her door. And I got news for you. The door isn't on the street. You're, the door is in your pocket. This is the door. Don't go near the door. You need, to, you, need to, you need to put locks on your door. Put locks on this door that can go to places that you don't even want to go. I know most of you sitting in first service, you know, a church on a Sunday, you don't want that. You don't want this stuff. You don't want to be doing that. I, I know you don't. So work proactively to keep it away from you. Lean in to the, to the wisdom that Solomon's trying to bring. He says, be proactive. Don't walk down her road. Don't go near her door. He didn't just say, hey, when that stuff pops up, bounce your eyes. That'll only work for so long. And if you keep putting yourself in that situation, you're a human being. You will eventually, because it's, because it draws us, it draws us in and it, it works against us. There's no amount of accountability, by the way, I have to say this, there's no amount of accountability that's gonna keep you completely safe. You're gonna have to use self-control eventually, but this is a great help because self-control muscle runs out. I don't know if you knew that, it's, like, it's psychological. This is like your mind, the way that your brain works. You can only express uh, self-control so long before you're eventually gonna eat that cookie if it's out on the, if it's out on the coffee table, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like if you're an alcoholic and you got alcohol, like, and you're at bars, that's on, that, that ship will sail. That ship will sail. So this is no different than that. Keep yourself as far away from possible so that when it gets close, you have the energy, the strength, and the self-control to say, nope, I'm out. That's how you stay safe. And number three, the way of the peer, stay alert at all times. Stay alert at all times. Like I'm saying, you have to always stay on guard with your self-control. Paul told Timothy, run from sexual immorality. Things like this is gonna take effort and energy. And here's what Solomon said, Proverbs 7.1. Follow my advice, my son. Always treasure my commands. Obey my commands and live. 
Guard my instructions as you would guard your own eyes. Tie them on your fingers as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Love them like a sister. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight a beloved member of your family. Let them protect you from an immoral affair or from an affair with an immoral woman, listening to the flattery of a promiscuous woman. The best way to do all of this, honestly, for me, when I was a young man, was jumping into the life of my church. All right, I got saved as a young man, 21 years old, and I was in the thick of everything, you know, working with people, you know, as a young man, you know, some of, I was even working with uh, Miss Katie right here. I was working, you know, at this, at this restaurant, you know, and there's waitresses and everybody's doing everything. And some of the people drank. And it's like, when you're in the world and just kind of like walking around in it and not tied into a local church, like I wasn't, you are vulnerable. And my life drastically changed when I set foot in this church and said, I'm all in here. It didn't go all the way away and like I didn't have to worry ever again, but I'm telling you, when I, t- when I say come to Growth Track, get involved in the life of your church, this is not just because we need another team member somewhere. This is because we all need this. We were created. Jesus said, on this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. When I say Come next week to Growth Track. Get involved in the life of the church. Start making this like a sister. That, isn't that what Solomon said? Make wisdom like a sister. That's a family member. That, and, and this church is like a family. We're supposed to be family with each other. So make wisdom. Make your church like a family where you are protected, insulated. And like, let's put it another way. You wouldn't be listening to this message if you weren't here right now. There you go. All right. So that's more evidence that this is going to be helpful for you. Jump into growth track, jump into the life of the church. It drastically changed my life. And I'm not just talking about for single people. Oh, get involved in the church because you're single and you're vulnerable. No, like married couples ought to be looking at each other going, you know what? Maybe it's time that we do this. Maybe it's better off for us and our family to like be here and to be all the way here and to jump in. You could come as long as you want and and we'll always love you no matter what. We're not going to put that on you, but I'm telling you, there is something to gain about being in the life of the church. Make, make wisdom like a sister. Make a member of your family. I'm not telling you to bring a sleeping bag and sleep up in here overnight. That is not, that's not okay. Don't do that. But you know what I'm saying. Like, let's, let's make church a thing again. Let's make it the thing. Like, I know we live up in, you know, California where everything's new and everything's different. I visit some places across the country and it's just a thing to do. Like, that's not what they struggle with is making church a thing for your life and for your family. But for, for here, I want to just encourage everybody here, man, this is, a, this is an important factor of living a Christian life is belonging to a church family and it'll keep you safe in this area as well. It'll help. Last thing, because what if we already failed? And I know some of us might be thinking, man, I'm already in that. I'm already kind of struggling with this. So I want to, I want to bless somebody today. If you've already failed, number four is this. If failure occurs, confess and repent promptly. That's that's it. That's it, y'all. Like, you don't have to feel guilted out. You don't have to feel condemned. You don't have to feel like like we're speaking down to anybody. No, 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 no. We all have to do this. We all have to confess and repent. But all I'm asking you to do is do it quickly because the longer we stand back and say, nah, I'm gonna try to fight this on my own, the more those claws get into us. And the more we get locked in, it becomes a bondage. That's a churchy word for, it's like locked. We feel trapped in it. That's why I said promptly, man, if a mistake happens, man, get out, get honest, get open, confess to God, confess to another person. Confess and repent promptly. God is good. He loves us. His mercies are new every morning. We've just got to own it. The sooner, the better. Listen to this scripture. It's so encouraging. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves not living in the truth. That evens the playing field for everybody. All of us. If anyone claims they haven't struggled in some area, you lying. (laughs) You lying. Quit lying. Quit lying. This church, don't lie. You, You lying. If we claim we have no sin, we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sin, ooh, this is, this is about as good as it gets. If we confess our sins to him, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from 
all wickedness. He's faithful. He's just. You know what that means? He's not just being nice about it. You're like, well, you know, I guess I'm going to forgive you this one time. No, it says he's faithful. I said I'd forgive you. I sent my son to die for you. And that means I'm going to forgive you. If you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just, dependable to forgive you of your sin. There is no one fully, totally trapped. No one that can't be redeemed unto salvation. That's for you. No matter what's been lost, you can always be redeemed unto salvation. And I want that for every single person here. God calls us to be completely holy. Completely holy. Imagine your life right now with no immorality of any kind. What about you? That's like none, not at all of any kind, completely holy. Now wake up because you dreaming. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just dreaming. We live in the world, you know, we live in the world. I can't even drive down the street without seeing billboards that are crazy. Come on, somebody go to Stockton. Tell me, I'm, tell me I'm lying. I got saved in Stockton. Don't make fun of Stockton. I was, I did it, I know. It's hard. Imagine your life completely holy, completely sanctified, completely void of immorality. Well, it may be impossible to live that way on this side of heaven, but there's a way to always come back to that. Confess it. As soon as anything happens, confess it. Get honest with someone. Get honest with God. Ask for forgiveness. Confess it immediately and repeatedly if needed. Don't get down on yourself, man. Just get open. Just get open as much as you can, as fast as you can. Is it an inappropriate relationship at work? Confess it right now. Confess it today. Confess it. Is it a lifestyle that doesn't line up with God's word? Confess it. Own it. Talk to somebody about it. Talk to God about it. Is it looking at things that are lustful? Confess it right now. Will there be backlash? Probably. Will there be restitution needed? Maybe. Will healing begin? Definitely. That's that's step one for all of us. Confess it. Own it. There's only one kind of sin God can't forgive. Unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. Unconfessed. There's only one sin he won't forgive. He, let me put it this way. He's a gentleman. He'll let you hang on to that as long as you want to. He's not going to rip it out of your hands. Even with the young lady I was with, it was her choice. She didn't have to. She didn't have to say yes. He might come all the way up and make everything change in your life, but it's up to us to, to say, all right, I'm letting it go. All right, I'm confessing it. He will let you hold on to your sin. Your, your sin is yours as long as you want to keep it. But if we confess our sin to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. I think that's a good place to pray, isn't it? Okay, come on, let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, thank you so much for your word that gives us the encouragement, your word that gives us the truth. Lord, sometimes it's a hard truth. Sometimes it's a big thing, but Lord, every single one of us we'll face this at one point in our life. Every single one of us is gonna face temptation, gonna face immorality, gonna face challenges. But Lord, I just pray right now that a uh, spirit of forgiveness would, would well up inside of us and that we would be open to ask for that forgiveness. And that's how, that's how I wanna pray over you, church. That's how I wanna pray is I wanna invite every person here that just needs any kind of forgiveness. No one's looking around at you. And let me just give you a hint. Almost everybody's gonna raise their hand. So don't worry about it. But if there's anyone here that needs forgiveness, that wants to receive forgiveness in any area, any and all area, if you're looking for forgiveness today, would you just shoot your hand up for me and say, that's, I need it. I want it. I want to be new. I want to be whole. I want to be reconciled. I don't want this to kill me. I don't want it to kill my family. I don't want to destroy my life. I don't want to destroy my kids. I don't want to destroy my legacy. I need it. If that's you, come on, it is time. It is your moment right here, right now to receive the forgiveness that comes freely by the blood of Jesus Christ. So if it's you, if you're ready to receive that forgiveness, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just walk you through a prayer, okay? This is for everybody who wants it. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for your son. 
that died on the cross, that paid the price in advance for all my sins. Thank you for your forgiveness. I confess I have sinned. I confess I've fallen short. And I receive your forgiveness. Fill me with your spirit and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.